Section uh, 2.3 of your textbook deals with matter and, and energy. So basically, every material object, all matter, has a certain amount of energy. Now, energy is, is a little bit hard to define. What is energy? There, there are very technical definitions of energy, and those definitions are beyond the scope of this course. So for energy, we're going to use a relatively informal definition. And our definition of energy is the ability that some piece of matter has that it can use to do some kind of work. And by work, what I mean is uh, the ability to push, pull, lift, or move other things. So that's what energy is. It's the ability that some piece of matter has to push or move other things around. <clears throat> and the idea, the idea behind this, or the take-home message here, is that different pieces of matter, different material things, have different amounts of energy. And it really depends on what they're made of as to how much energy they have. This uh, picture on the left shows the first atomic bomb and this is a piece of matter and it has a tremendous amount of energy associated with it um, that was unleashed as a bomb. On the right here we have uh, three pieces of wood or a cartoon of three pieces of wood but the idea is that this is a different this is different matter it's a different piece of matter and it has a different amount of energy associated with it than the piece of matter on the left. Some things have a lot of energy some things not so much. So that's our introduction to matter and energy. And so beyond the introduction, there are actually two kinds of energy. The first kind of energy is called potential energy. And potential energy is basically the energy that's stored inside of a piece of material that is not being used. And again, the example that I would use is um, the, these three pieces of wood here. So you could imagine that they're sitting next to your fireplace, and if they're not being burned, they have potential energy. In other words, they have energy that's stored inside of them that's not being used. And you could set them on fire and you would release some of that energy. But if they're just sitting there uh, next to the fireplace not doing anything, then they have potential energy. The other type of energy is called kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is basically the energy that some piece of material has because it's moving. And here the example that I would use is this baseball here. This baseball had a certain amount of kinetic energy that, it was that, uh, that was associated with its motion. So there was energy associated with the motion of the ball, and it transferred that energy to this baseball player's face when it hit him. So those are the two main types of energy. Potential energy, that's energy stored inside of something that's not being used. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with the motion of something. So, if I, uh, as another example, if I threw one of the pieces of wood across a room, then as it was moving across the room, it would have kinetic energy. So, a question that you might want to think about related to energy, um, here's the first question. Here's a car that is traveling down the road. Does this car have kinetic energy? Well, kinetic energy is the energy associated with a piece of material that is moving, and this car is a piece of material and it's moving, so this car certainly has kinetic energy. The second question is, does this car have potential energy? That one might be a little bit trickier. Um, the, the answer is almost certainly yes. Uh, you might think that a piece of material can either have kinetic energy or potential energy, but in reality, a piece of material can have both. And the idea is that even though this car is moving and because of that it has kinetic energy, you can probably extract even more energy out of it. So uh, because you can extract more energy out of this car even though it's moving, then the car at least has some potential energy. Here's a second uh, example. Here's a parked car. The question is, does this car have kinetic energy? Well, it's not moving. Um, as far as we're concerned, it's not moving, so it doesn't have kinetic energy. And the, the second question again is, does the car have potential energy? And here the answer is yes, right? The, the car can, can move, um, you can move the car and it will have a certain amount of energy associated with it. And because you can potentially move the car, then the car has potential energy. That's energy that's not currently being used. Now, I just mentioned that uh, different pieces of material can have large amounts of energy and some other materials can have low amounts of energy. Because of that, 
you can basically put a number on how much energy something has. And because you can measure or put a number on how much energy something has, uh, you ha actually have to have units for, for describing energy in numerical terms. So there are different units for describing the amount of energy that things have. Uh, one of the more common ones is a unit called joules. So this is just a, a unit for describing how much energy you have. And you don't necessarily need to know how much one joule is, but you should know that joule is a certain amount of energy. A kilojoule is 1,000 joules. That's 1,000 joules of energy. And a millijoule is if you took one joule of energy and broke it into 1,000 even pieces. So the same prefixes that we used for other metric units also work for joules, which is used to describe energy. There is another common unit for describing energy. It's called the calorie. I imagine that everyone here, or everyone listening to this, um, is familiar with the unit for calorie. Calorie is basically just a measure, uh, a unit for measuring energy. And again, just like the joule, um, if you have a thousand calories, that makes one kilocalorie. And if you take one single calorie and break it into a thousand even pieces, then each piece is called a millicalorie. And so you're probably familiar with calories because uh, that's often used to describe food. And basically the, when you're describing calories in food, you're describing how much energy is associated with that piece of food. Um, there's section 2.4 in your book, and I want to briefly go over this. Um, there isn't much to discuss except for the things that I would like you to know. I would like you to know uh, that water freezes and melts at 32 degrees Fahrenheit that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And I want you to know what those numbers are in different unit systems. Specifically, I want you to know what those numbers are in Celsius and in Kelvin. In Celsius, water melts or freezes at 0 degrees Celsius. So 0 degrees Celsius is the same thing as 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Water uh, boils at 100 degrees, Fahrenheit, uh, 100 degrees Celsius um, so 100 degrees Celsius is the same thing as 212 Fahrenheit. And then I told you earlier that Kelvin, to get the number, uh, the temperature of something in Kelvin, you just take the uh, temperature in Celsius and you add 273. Now, more, a little more specifically, it's adding 273.15, but 273 is close enough. So if the temperature outside is 0 degrees Celsius, then the temperature in Kelvin is 273 Kelvin. And this is the temperature that water freezes or melts at in, in uh, Kelvin. And if the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, which would be very hot, it would be boiling, uh, the temperature for boiling water, then the temperature in Kelvin would be 373 Kelvin. So again, the idea is to get the temperature in Kelvin, you take the temperature in Celsius and add 273. There are formulas for converting between the different units of temperature. I don't expect you to know these. I do expect you to be able to use them. So as an example, if I asked what is the temperature in Kelvin if it's 40 degrees Celsius outside, well, here's the formula for converting Celsius to Kelvin. You take the degrees Celsius, you add 273, and that will equal the temperature in Kelvin. So what is 40 degrees Celsius in Kelvin? It's 40 plus 273. The more complicated ones are converting between Fahrenheit and Celsius and, and vice versa. So if I asked you what is 40 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit, you would use this formula up at the top. Degrees Fahrenheit equals 1.8 times the number of degrees Celsius plus 32. So uh, I believe that 1.8 times 40 degrees Celsius is 72, and then 72 plus 32 is 104. So 40 degrees Celsius in degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 104 degrees Fahrenheit.